and for us to continue to develop as a, a legitimate, the legitimate wonderful art form it is, we do need some way of recording and moving it forward. How many reinterpretations of a Shakespearean show has there been? You know, so, right. so many. And we should be able to do that with puppets too, to add our own twist to once it's an established show, uh, to move that forward, to move that needle forward in that way. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today we have the lovely Pam Arciero here. Welcome to the show, Pam. Thank you so much. Lovely to be back. <laughs> it's so good to have you back. And Pam, for anyone who doesn't know or didn't see her first episode, episode on the show, um, she is a performer with Sesame Street and all sorts of other wonderful television projects uh, from throughout the years. She's also the artistic director at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, and she does directing and all sorts of puppetry things all over the world. Um, and it's great to have her back. Pam Marciero, welcome to Puppet Tears. Welcome back to Puppet Tears. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I'm especially glad, uh, excited for this because we already have a lot of your origin story out of the way. So if people definitely recommend listening to the first one uh, before this, or, or depending on what kind of information you want. But now we can really get into the nitty gritty of puppetry with you, which I'm so excited about. But uh, let's start off with just uh, what, what are you uh, working on now? Well, basically, all our work pretty much dried up with the pandemic, of course. Um, we, I had a whole slew of projects on Slate, including the Sesame Street movie was supposed to come up, and uh, that's been put on hiatus. We don't know if it'll come back, when it'll come back, or if it'll come back, I should say. Um, I was directing a couple of uh, new shows for uh, the Beaches Resorts, and that's also been put on hold. And also for Sesame Place, we're putting in a new Halloween show. Everything's been put on hold. Right. Um, and we were, had one more week of Sesame Street, which was also put on hold. Um, and hopefully we're going to go back and do, and that's season 51, the last week of season 51. And we're going to go back and shoot that. They're thinking October if we can, but it is a little complicated to figure out how do we do puppet shows that close together? Yeah. Um, I yeah. mean, that's really a thing we're all kind of trying to figure out. It's terrible to try and perform wearing a mask. Um, and yet we're awfully close together as puppeteers, as you know, we're in each other's armpits all the time and right, right, right next to each other. Six foot distancing would make a very boring puppet show unless it's solo, you know. So. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. That, I, that, that's not even just in the case when two characters are interacting, but even to control one character, you need two people right up to each other, just like you're saying, like to do any uh, live hand characters with two hands. Yeah. Or even someone like Abby, you know, when she picks up her wand, she needs that second help because the wand is re really has a life of its own when it moves. Mm. Um, and and any time they're handling props or doing anything, any of the skinny little rod armed puppets also need a second helper. So it is hard. Um, it'll be interesting. We'll have to, we're trying to figure out ways now. We're sort of kicking around ideas about how we could possibly go back in and do that. Um, we don't know. Yeah. Well, and another thing is too is like it probably not only from a logistical um, standpoint should it, would it have to be different, but I would imagine you know even if there was big plans for next year a lot of that curriculum is probably going to be changing to adapt more to what's happening in the world now. Right. Well, see, um, season 51 was a finish out. We were doing, um, basically, we're supposed to do the Cookie Monster Gonger series. That was the last week of shooting was going to be all the um, monster foodies. So that stuff probably wouldn't change too much because that's, you know, that's about how food is created and that's not going to change. Season 52, which they are just starting to write, um, I'm sure is going to reflect what's going on with the pandemic. Because yeah. um, uh, even though we, we don't know what's going to happen, it's definitely going to impact the fall, I think, for most of us, at least, and maybe Absolutely. longer. So it's been a very interesting time, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is for sure. Um, and, uh, of course, this has also impacted... Um, the the schedule for the O'Neill Puppetry Conference, which um, is especially um, disappointing, knowing that this would have been the the thirtieth season uh, for puppetry. Can you talk about what we're doing uh, to to uh, make that happen still? 
Well, yes, it is extremely disappointing. It's the it's the, the 30th anniversary of the conference when we started, and um, we had big plans. <laughs> yeah. And now we have smaller plans, but still, um, normally the conference runs um, between 10 and 12 days, depending on the what the pre-conference has and what we've. Um, We've winnowed it down to being five days and we're going to do it online. Um, not all of the, the strands could be taught uh, via internet. Um, and as you know, so much of the O'Neill is about the camaraderie and the being together and having people with you who understand what you're doing and how you're doing it. So we, we're Jean Marie and I work very hard to figure out a way we can still sort of have that feeling, um, even though we're all like you, um, we talked previously about experiencing Zoom fatigue, um, we're hoping this will change it some. And what we've done is we have, um, I have to pull up my schedule because there's a lot of things. Um, we've done a schedule and it'll be from June 8th through 12th, and that's a Monday through Friday. And we are starting at about um, 11 a.m. Um, and we're going till 10 o'clock at night. And 11 a.m. because so that people on the West Coast will be starting at 8. And then um, we have a lot of internationals, so they'll be starting it at four or five or six in the afternoon and working through midnight. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to figure out the challenge of having so many internationals involved with what we do and how we get that to happen. Um, basically, Alice uh, Goschak is going to be teaching from Germany. So she's doing a morning warm up every day. Um, and let me go back and start it uh, not, uh, just in terms of the, of the schedule. Sure. Well, like the real conference, we're going to have an opening hour or so where everybody gets to see each other on a big Zoom meeting. And then we will go and you will be with your guest artists if you've signed up with a guest artist and you will work with them for a, an hour or so. And then there's a lunch break and then another hour, hour or so with your guest artists. And then we have tea time with Jim and Judy, like we always do. Mm -hmm. And that's optional. And those of you who don't know, tea time is when Jim Rose and Judy Rose um, serve tea at the O'Neill. And everyone comes in just to talk. And it's about any subject matter you want. Usually it's puppet and orientation. Sometimes it's not. And that, that event is going to be exactly the same. Except we're going to do it. I've been working with Jim and Judy and there's, and their zooming ability. I was going to say, <laughs> really? that's, that's the real miracle. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You know, for two people in their mid to late eighties, they're doing really well with it. So we've been doing practice sessions and figuring out how to make that happen. Um, and great. then you go back and work with your, um, your guest artists. We also have, oh, we have master classes in there too. They'll be like, we always do. We have the one hour master class. And so we have the master classes we have are going to be Ronnie Burkett's going to do a one hour master class. Yael Razuli's doing one from Israel. Um, uh, Jim Krupa's going to do a talk about what he would have done because he built all these puppets and he's very disappointed. Um, Berend Ogrodnik is going to be speaking from Iceland about um, marionettes, puppeteering, and meditation techniques. And then uh, Fabrizio Montecchi from Italy will be doing a master class on that Friday about um, puppetry and directing and shadow puppets. So that's a, that particular series, you can actually um, buy a pass to and get in to see all of that series if you want, if you're not a participant in the main conference. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah, so that's, it's $125 for all five of those master classes. Um, and then in the evenings, we have um, the pub, and the pub is open to the public. So after people have gone through their specific strands, um, at nine o'clock, Jim, uh, Jim, John Little and Tyler Bunch will be hosting a pub. And we are going to, um, basically it's curated, you have to apply to be in the pub, but it's our usual pub thing where there'll be comedy and joking and in between all the pieces and any piece you would like to show, you're welcome to show and sign up for. And Cam, I'm counting on that. You always are <laughs> one of our biggest participants. <laughs> I would love to. And you know what? Because um, I started a new job this year. And um, so I knew I wasn't going to be able to make it to the conference. I did. This is the first year uh, since 2012 that I didn't even apply um, just because I knew I couldn't couldn't take the time off. So I'm I'm ecstatic that I'm going to be able to see pub shows and um, and maybe perform a little bit too, albeit 
in this different situation. Yeah, it is. And, um, and the same rules apply to our pub, you know, nobody boos. You can't, nobody's going to, if you write something bad online, you will be banned. <laughs> oh, I know all about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. You have to listen uh, to our Jean, uh, episode with Jean Marie to learn more about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, that that is so exciting though. What uh, are you, are you using uh, Zoom as platforms for most of this? Believe we're lose, using Zoom. That's what the O'Neill is planning to do. The O'Neill is handling the technical side for us. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's, that's really nice. Um, and they will provide technical support throughout the whole conference. So if someone's class goes down for any reason, they will be on standby to come and jump in and and problem solve for us because that that did have me quite a bit concerned. You know, like yeah. what happens when it suddenly stops and nobody knows why we, you know, we can't lose that time with our guys and, and particularly the Europeans will only be able to really make the morning class, the morning and afternoon classes, the evenings and the pubs are going to be way too late for them. Mm-hmm. And we have people all the way from Australia to Israel. So um, it's, it's quite a, a, a span of time. Let me tell you who our guest artists are, who are teaching though. We have, Please. um, Edwin Salas, who is teaching um, a course called The Breath of God, the political arts and the puppet's arts and how they intersect. And he's a wonderful um, Mexican performer. Um, Incredible. He did a show at the Puppeteers of America last year um, called Dante on the Border, which was just amazing. He's a wonderful performer and he does solo shows. So he's helping these people create politically oriented, socially responsible shows in that, in that context. So people will be working with that. We have Alice Gotchek, who's teaching materials and movement, her usual movement class. Um, she'll be teaching that as well. Um, and then we have Tim McKeon, who wrote The Helpsters, and also uh, it was the creator of um, Adventure Time, the cartoon. And he's teaching writing for um, television, puppetry and television writing. Um, you know, I'm so silly. Did I forget? To, who am I forgetting? Um, d- d- Jim and uh, Kurt, are they oh, still? Oh, Jim Rose and yes. Kurt. Yes, yes. Marionettes. Um, they're doing marionettes remotely. You order it when you sign up for the class. Each uh, person will receive a kit from Jim and Kurt, and they will work alongside. Uh, Kurt will be building it directly along in time with the, the puppeteers building and Jim will be doing some of that, but mostly he'll be advising and talking. Um, and then Jim Nappy is teaching a shadow puppet course. And with oh, that great. course, um, you actually get, he's building specific shadow st- screens that everyone will receive one. You, you purchase it as part of your materials kit and you will receive a Jim Nappy screen, which is fantastic. They're really is- <laughs> portable and wonderful. So those, there's those five strands. And then we have a sixth strand, which is our participant projects, just like we have participant projects at the regular O'Neill in the evenings that you work on. What we're doing with this one is you work full time on your participant projects and mm-hmm. it will be basically obviously be a solo show because everyone's working alone. I mean, it could be, we haven't received those because we changed it. So the applications are really, are closing tonight for the, for the participant projects. They're literally closing tonight. Um, oh. So we don't know what we've gotten in terms of um, projects and what we'll need. And, um, in, and we're, what we're thinking is everybody will be assigned a mentor. I mean, and, and it's new, right? Because we don't know how this is going to work. But um, everybody will be assigned a mentor just like you normally are. And then if people need other services, say you're doing a shadow show, then we're going to assign a mentor who's good in shadows. And then if you need someone who's doing dramaturgy, then, you know, because you need a better story arc, then Lexi, our dramaturge, will come in and, and visit with you. So throughout the day, even though you have time, basically, I don't know how much time each person will spend with you, you'll, you can set up times all day long to meet with your mentors and discuss whatever issue is going on. Um, and at the end of the week, just like we always do, we will have a show and tell of all the strands. Um, and that's going from 7 to 10, I believe, on Friday. Um, and that's for the participants and everyone will be able to see as though we have a public performance, but it's not because everyone will just basically do a show and tell of what happened in their strand and whatever they want to read a few lines of their play or show what they developed in Edwin's class. Um, 
that will happen. And then the pub will happen after that. Um, from That's a later night for the pubs, or the final night of the pub as usual. And then we're going to have a virtual bonfire. No. <laughs> 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 well, actually, we're going to have to make that happen. Yeah. We're trying to figure out the virtual barbecue, the bar virtual oh. barbecue. Yes. <laughs> the other thing we're trying to figure out, everyone has to bring their best barbecue dish and hold yeah. it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Grill their pineapples. <laughs> right. Everyone has to have grilled pineapple in order to participate. Um, so there are little things like that throughout the week we're trying to make happen. But those are the main highlights of it, you know. Um, and I hope it'll be different enough. People have been saying to me, oh, everyone's teaching online now. And that's da, da, da. And I know everyone is teaching online. That's what we have to do. Yeah. But um, part of it for us is the camaraderie and the connection. So like with the participant projects, every morning we will have a, a general meeting where everyone checks in and talks to each other and finds out what's going on um, with their specific project and every morning Alice is actually going to do a warm-up so there'll be a one-hour physical and puppeteering warm-up at the start of each day which everybody is welcome to attend and because it's 11 o'clock in the morning I think most people might make it yeah <laughs> <laughs> unlike the eight o'clock in the morning ones we used to do right I was gonna say if you're on the east coast in the U.S. you're you're in the sweet spot <laughs> exactly exactly it makes That's it right. easy wow. now uh, a qu question I have is is because of this because of it being online, you potential have an opportunity to maybe have more students in a class than normal. Is that something you guys are doing or are you trying to still keep it to the same size? We're keeping it to the same size because the mentors and the teachers, um, I mean, number one, it was their choice. When we talked to all of the artists, invited them to figure out if they wanted to do this, um, they all had their specific requirements. And one of the things that they wanted to do is maintain that personal contact. So, um, you know, someone like Tim McKeon didn't want more than eight people because that's all he felt comfortable handling that amount of information coming in. And, um, you know, Jim Rose didn't want more than 10 people because you couldn't really keep track of more than 10 marionettes being built at once. It's challenging even with two people. Oh, yeah. So, right. um, so most, all of the classes are limited at this point. And yes, you're right. I, it had occurred to us we could do a really big, you know, huge amount of people coming in, but that became complicated both technically um, and financially, right? Because right. we do have to pay our artists for spending that time with us. So we do need to figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. And we've wor worked very hard to make sure everybody got some kind of scholarship this year in terms of being of, of paying for the conferences. Um, um, and as much, we just tried to make sure that we kept the cost as low as possible because we know that all of us are out of work. You know, all of us performing puppeteers are really, there's no money coming in, there's just none. So how do you afford, even if it's only, um, I think some of, some of the puppeteers only paying 50 bucks to come, even that could be a challenge for some of our puppeteers. Um, so I think, it's it's been a good way to make sure that our guest artists are paid and yeah. that we have the right number of people involved. That's true. That's a good point because, yeah, this was designed to be that type of an intimate class. If you were actually designing like an online course or something from the beginning, now we're trying to take something that was going to be in person, putting it more online, and you want to keep that intimate feel, which is which is great because that is the, some, the biggest piece to me in my experience in going to uh, the O'Neill – where I got the most value out of just being in this small niche group of people. Yeah. And we, we know that's, that's the key, right? Because it's the community we're building and, and, and we are a very odd small community. And if you add a lot of outside people who don't quite get what that's going on, I mean, there's a reason our pro application process is complicated and you guys know, cause you've been through it. Right. And it's to make sure that people coming are very much committed to being puppeteers and developing puppet work. Um, it'd be lovely to teach a general puppetry class where anyone who wants to come and learn about puppetry could do that. Maybe we'll do that at some point, but that's not really what the O'Neill is. The O'Neill really is about, uh, you know, basically professional puppeteers coming to get inspired and learn to do new work. Um, and that's what we're committed to. So hence keeping the, the conference a little bit con more contracted helped uh, maintain that ideal for us. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's on brand with the O'Neill Center as a whole, right? Like, it, you know, just because the, the musical theater conference is online this year uh, doesn't mean that, you know, they're going to open the floodgates to, you know, 100 different musicals or whatever. So. Well, and you can't. Again, you know, we right. do, we're very uh, much about the personal contact and the development of each of the artists. So if you have, you know, 50 artists, how do you, you'd have to have that many more teachers to make that personal contact happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just really impractical in that way to maintain and control what was going on with everybody and, yeah. you know, provide the kind of personal attention that we'd like to give our artists who are coming in. Yeah. yeah now great. has, has the rest of the O'Neill conferences, are they all doing a similar model as well? Um, I'm, the models are being developed for the rest okay. of the conferences, but yes, everything will be online this year because, um, there's just, there was no way to guarantee that we could have groups of people there. And there's no way to guarantee that people would even want to come to the theaters yet. Right. Right. You know, so yeah. much of us, what we do is those uh, with the rest of the conferences in particular, you know, they do a performance of the play or of the musical they work on it for seven to 10 days. And then they do another performance and the audience response is a huge part of developing those plays and musicals. And we couldn't even, even if we could open, we can't guarantee that people are going to come and, and provide that. So um, it became very complicated to, to have an O'Neill summer this year. And it's really quite heartbreaking because this is Preston's last summer. Preston is um, moving on to another right. job. So um, for us not to even have a summer to say goodbye to Preston was pretty tough. Um, and Preston and Chandler have been fantastic in developing this with us. They've been really supportive and wonderful. So um, in terms of the, you know, the online version of it, they've been really good. So, and I don't know, we, I, like I said, the models are still being developed. I don't know, maybe everyone will be able to watch some of these. I mean, maybe it'll be a way that you, you know, pay five dollars and you can watch the development of the play. I, I, they have not quite decided what they're doing. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. Because on one side, you know, I could see it being a potential opportunity to get uh, more people's eyes on it than would normally be on it. But, but you're right. You know, for as far as being involved in it, um, you know, that wouldn't be possible because of the the mission of the O'Neill. But, um, but hopefully, yeah, if there's a way to have people to be able to just like to peek in, even at for certain parts or something, I think it could, um, uh, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of people who are in a situation now where they actually don't have a lot more time, but there also are a lot of people that are, are just stuck at home even by themselves and just need something to keep busy. So, you know, everyone really has a different situation and, and this is really a great opportunity for a lot of people who otherwise might not have been able to be involved in something like this. Yeah. We, we're not sure too, because the artists, a lot of it is about writing. So maybe they'll just write for the time being, if you don't have a full audience and you don't have actors, right? Yeah. So all the actors and the reading of the plays has to be done via zoom and people have been doing that to some extent, but um, I don't know how satisfying it is for an audience to watch that necessarily. I don't know how satisfying it is for actors to interact that way and develop their characters and, and the rehearsal process. It's all um, pretty new. So everyone is, is trying to figure out how to make that work. I mean, and hopefully next year we'll have a real conference again, you know, yeah. all the conferences will happen. Um, It'd be terrifying to think we have to wait two years, but that is what we've heard as well. It may not be till 2022. Um, so this year is an experiment. Hopefully next year will be back to normal. Um, and you know, I, I can't imagine that we can't, in a year, can't figure out how to make this happen in terms of the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not as though this virus is going to go away. It's going to be with us forever. So we do have to figure out how to function um, with it and maybe make it better. Um, 
Well, one thing that might be interesting that could hopefully come out of this, uh, maybe perhaps, uh, you know, I hope that there's a lot of really great things that are discovered in doing it this way too, and maybe even in the future, this could be in like an additional like O'Neill, maybe even a different time of the year or something, because because again, I think I think this would make it accessible to people who maybe might not have otherwise been able to. Right, like a winter term or something. We yeah, could exactly. do something like that. And, um, you know, one of the things we're doing is that even though we're recording these sessions for archival purposes, we made sure that our artists know that it is, it's totally locked down. It, they, they will not be available except through, um, you know, through the, the participants will be the only ones getting this information, just as though you were in a private classroom. Yeah. Um, I think that became an issue for some people, too, about wanting to make sure that it is, it is private. You know, it, yeah. it is an intimate event that we provide in a, a one-on-one -on -one education and that's we don't necessarily want that spilled all over the world because it is a it is a really personal thing that should be your choice if you want it to be out there or not you know De definitely yeah and um it's just speaking to some of the resilience that you were talking about a moment ago um we i was in a um a group chat uh, happy hour with some puppeteer friends a week or two ago and we were just talking about like who better than puppeteers to have to be you know shut in and taken on this crazy thing because a place like the O'Neill teaches you all these wonderful resources on how to find that creativity and how to keep productive and all those things so um, it it means a lot that you guys have have put in the work to to make this all happen so I know there's more more to happen still, but but thank you for all the work you and Jean Marie and everyone have has done so far. Yeah, it, and it's kind of exciting because actually today, uh, people who I just started getting the list of people who are accepting to come in. We were also scared that nobody would want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody mm -hmm. would take the chance. And that was like, a, well, what do we do then? I mean, and then right. we just don't have anything. But um, it looks like we're going to have a full complement of people. Um, uh, just from the last, the latest list came in about a half an hour ago. So it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, this weekend we'll determine exactly how many we have. And um, in terms of just informationally, in terms of how you can access um, the, the master classes and the pub, um, that all that information will be out for sure by June 1st. On June 1st, we'll have a release of how to do it. Since it's June 8th, it gives you a week to figure out all of that stuff. Is what Perfect. we're hoping. So, and and those things for uh, like the the pub and the ma um, well the master classes you said were for everybody. Is the pub just for alums? No, the pub will be for everybody at this point. We're planning to have it for everybody, um, and hopefully we'll be able to solicit a little bit of donations to keep everybody um, who performs. You know, give maybe give them something, maybe not, um, but to help the O'Neill continue to do this um, yeah. and the technical side of it. It's, you know, it's without the performances where we are losing a fair amount that goes into the O'Neill. And then um, it's a lot harder to get the normal foundations and people who donate to us when it's not an actual theater event, right? Mm -hmm. It's another online thing. So, um, and yet still the O'Neill, there's the buildings that have to be maintained. There's everything that's there and the staff that has to run all that stuff still has to be paid. So balancing that is, has been a challenge for everybody concerned at this point. And is it, you know, the O'Neill is a public park, right? So the, the right. governor, the governor of Connecticut shut all the public parks. So technically nobody's even allowed to walk, set foot on the O'Neill right now. You know, so. Oh, wow. I hadn't even. Thought yeah, that. the people yeah. working there are the only people, you know, like um, Eric, our, our, the, head of, the head of the grounds there, he's the only person there, you know, wow. um, just not allowed on it. So it's been a very interesting time, I do have to say. <laughs> Yes. Well, we'd, we'd love to talk about some uh, happier times before all this. And um, as, as we mentioned at, at the top of, of this, uh, you're, you're our first returning guest outside of, of Jim Krupa. And so we, we're, we're just really excited for this opportunity to talk a little bit 
uh, more about your work and your philosophy and all those things. Um, I guess the, you know, I've, there's a lot of reasons why I, I admire your work, but I, I really think in addition to like this, the Sesame things that you do, all the different ways that you um, approach directing and the, the scope of things that you've directed. Um, do you remember the first show that you, um, that you directed? Well, I did some directing in college, which were smaller little teeny puppet show things that, um, uh, there were, I don't quite remember what they are anymore, but that's kind of where it started. And you know, as a puppeteer, you're kind of always self-directing, right? You just, mm -hmm. you constantly have to make those assessments and judgments. But the first kind of big paid for show was, um, uh, I think it was called Elmo's, Elmo's World Live maybe at, at Sesame Place. And that was uh, about 16 or 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. That was the first live walk around shows that I started directing. And I did a lot of those, um, done lots and lots of those, which is the big walk around characters, um, making sure that the dancing, singing, moving all matches what our Sesame characters are and stay true to who they are. You know, because for a while when they had them, of course, you, you've all seen walk arounds that are terrible and don't move right and scare the hell out of kids that's not what we want. So in order to maintain um, the quality that we're used to in our characters, um, I was brought in initially just to kind of supervise and say, no, you know, Bert doesn't move like that. You can't have Bert skipping and hopping that way. Um, and they'd had the touring shows for some time, which had some control, but I sort of took the smaller things like Sesame Place, um, SeaWorld, they did some shows out at SeaWorld. Uh, and then eventually to the beaches and the resorts, um, Puerto Ventura, which is a, um, in Barcelona, there's a park there. I've done shows for them. Um, I did shows in Saudi Arabia as well. And that, uh, was in 2016, I think it was. Um, and that was super interesting. Um, Saudi Arabia was one of those places that, you know, was never high on my list of places to go, but, <laughs> but it was wonderful and fun and very interesting. Um, I did have to wear an abaya the whole time I was there, even though I was told I didn't. But um, if you didn't dress appropriately, you were invisible as a woman. No one would talk to you. No one would pick you up in a cab. Nobody would do anything if you weren't dressed appropriately. So it became an issue to do that. And let me tell you, it's pretty hard to, to direct sing all singing, all dancing characters in a long black dress. Like kind of like a graduation gown, you know, it's like right. imagine doing everything you have to do in a giant graduation gown. That's what it was like. Um, but it was a wonderful experience in that I met great people, um, all, all guys allowed to, to perform, of course, no women. But they were, they were all very positive then that it was going to change and women were going to get rights. And, you know, and I said, mm -hmm. they were young and aspirational. So it's been what? four or five years and yeah, well, women did get the right to drive there now. So that's a big deal. I don't think they can have their own bank account still, but they can drive. So that's good. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel all over the world to, sh to share that kind of information. And, and uh, I was last directing and teaching in um, South Africa in August. I was there helping to reboot uh, a Sesame Street television show called um, Takalani Sesame. And um, oh, it's, been a, it's been around there a long time, but they were redeveloping it. And so I had, was lucky enough to go and help train puppeteers and get them on their, help them get the show up on its feet. It was really quite a wonderful experience. So. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about it at first, you, you might wonder, like, why would they send the puppeteer to to do that? And uh, no, I can't think of anyone better from Sesame because I'm, I'm sure you've had to double for just about every character on the show, practically. Uh, and with your your background, um, you, we learned last time that you you have a major in, in dancing. Um, yeah, that's just um that's so great. And I'm sure uh, the people who, who do those those performances probably really appreciate having uh, someone from the street to really uh, coach them and, and give them those those pointers. 
I think it, I think it was, they have had them in the past. I mean, the show, but they hadn't done new shows in over 10 years. And the performers were the same from before. Like they have an Elmo and they have a few, um, they have their own characters there. They have a couple, and then they were um, putting in a um, new Grover character, which is very interesting to hear a Grover with a South African accent. I gotta <laughs> tell you, it was really cool. <laughs> so, um, but yes, helping them understand where they come from. And it's very interesting. You know, we think that that humor is sort of something that's universal and some of it is, but there are also things that very specific countries find funny that we don't find funny, you know, I mean, so, or vice versa, they don't mm -hmm. get whatever joke we're doing. So it's sort of interesting to go into a foreign country and help them develop the characters and help them develop humor. And it's sort of interesting. Puppets always kind of carry humor well because it's physical, right? So when someone does something physically funny, it's funny. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need the language um, to make that, to make those jokes. And that's what puppets are really great at, at doing physically funny, um, humorous, odd movements that makes, that reaches out without language. And that's, that's one of the gifts of being a puppeteer, of course, that we can do it that way. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um... Yeah, and that, that must be. Oh, oh go ahead, Adam. No, no, I was gonna say. Um, do you have? Can you think of an example of like something that was like funny, uh, in in that situation that wouldn't be uh, funny in in other cultures? Um, because because one thing it just makes me think of is um how even like with like uh like children's books and stuff like rhyming books like just because it works in English if it's translated it doesn't really work because you know the rhyming isn't the same. Yeah, and exactly. That, so, and and even some simple jokes like, "What does a rooster sound like?" We go er 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 er, right? Er, 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 er. In South Africa, they went tok 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 tok, and so their rooster wasn't sounding appropriate. We had a rooster character, and I was like, "Why isn't the rooster clucking?" And they go, "What do you mean?" You know. So there's simple yeah. things. Um, there's little things like that. So then the joke maybe a joke about a er, 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 joke that's written by someone in the U S and sent over there absolutely has no, no basis in understanding, you know, um, it, there's, there's minor things like that, that don't carry. I'm not thinking of anything. And those little one, those little things though are, are kind of the big things in a way, cause that's what makes, you know, a society, uh, you know, just flow is, is those kind of, that kind of, uh, um, shorthand almost of of conversation in the way even a lot of the way that we're speaking now isn't necessarily what would be taught in an english class to someone learning english correct yeah. and the other thing that's interesting with south africa of course they have i think it's 12 officially recognized languages wow and some of them you know that some most of them speak three or four, which is astonishing to me. Every person you met spoke three or four. Most of them did speak English and Afrikaans. Those are the two which are taught in school. But then there were many, many people who just spoke the four tribal languages that they learned and didn't necessarily know English. So then you get into when you've written something in English, how does that translate? Especially, you know, they had the, it's an S sound, you know what I mean? So they'd be talking in their language and, one of my, um, one of the auditionees, I also auditioned a ton of people to go into the show, but her name was Saw. And, and you go, Saw, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took a long time to get used to. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and, and then, as you said, like to hear Grover with a, a South African accent, like they're just, you know, because sometimes when you write for a character, you make sure to hit certain letters or sounds that like really help enhance that character. And for that playbook to potentially be be thrown out, too, is just, yeah, that's that's why I never thought of that. Specific sense of humor that Grover you know, the fact that Grover always thinks he's doing, he knows what he always knows what's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some cultures that men always do that. So that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, what's funny about that? Guys always think they're right. So um, it was interesting because, because we kind of had to make sure there were a couple of people who really did not get Grover's sense of humor when they auditioned. They didn't understand his 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 sense of 
the insecurity because even he says he's right, but he knows he's wrong and he's just doing it because he's insecure and he's moving from that point. So to explain that to someone and why it's funny when they don't in, instinctively get it was really a challenge. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I would imagine it's probably also kind of tough to know, like even when you're trying to give direction, what is even uh, like appropriate because like something because again not having a full grasp of of their humor you don't want to accidentally change something just because maybe you didn't realize that that's the way it was kind of like the example you were saying with the rooster is do you have like a um like a, an assistant director or someone yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the whole production make sure... team is african south african and um one of the things i would do all the time too is say is that, is this funny? Is, is yeah. this funny? <laughs> Does, do you guys think this is funny? Because we would read a script or we'd do something and I think it was funny and I'd be laughing. And sometimes, yes, of course they laughed out loud. And again, because most of them speak English, they do understand English senses of humor. But I, I would, I always double check in actually any foreign country I work in to make sure that I'm understanding what their sense of humor and what their needs are in terms of the culture that, you know, would be not funny to me yeah. and they think it's a riot or vice versa. Right. So um, I think the smartest thing to do, and particularly as a director in those sentence instances is to check in with them and say, this is what, yeah. Or are we all on know. the same page here? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Is, is this working for you guys? Cause if it's not, let's change it. So it does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, is what we strive for. So. Um, and so some of the other, um, directing things that you've done, um, you know, in, in all of these instances, or, or I should say, at least in a lot of these instances, you're maybe meeting, um, performers who have never touched a puppet before. Um, and not only for, for those Sesame co-productions, but I'm thinking even, I know, uh, we've talked you and I before about, um, directing Avenue Q, for instance, and there in a lot of cases, you just get, um, you know, actors, or, you know, theater, theater folk who've never put a puppet on before. So what, um, what are some of the things that you try to make sure that you, give to those people so that as quickly as they can, they can put on the puppet and, and get into it and, and feel as comfortable as they need to be to, to do the show. Well, it's interesting because it does depend. I also just recently directed for the, um, in January, over the last couple of years, I've been working with um, the riddle of the trilobites, which was a musical. Um, yeah, and, that's right. And, um, they were all wonderful singers and actors, dancers, but not necessarily puppeteers. So, and um, so figuring out how to get them into that space is part of the challenge of, you know, I was brought in to do the puppet directing and to figure out how to figure the movement that they need to learn. Um, and with Avenue Q, obviously you teach them basic limp sync and you teach them focus and you get them as comfortable as you can with that. Um, and then you talk, I always do a big thing about movement, that puppets are about moving. We're not about um, staying stagnant. And if you just stay here and sing a song and you don't add any movement into it, it then they're looking at you. And sometimes in Avenue Q, you will see that. You'll see people who literally start to sing a song and then the puppet moves back and then all you're seeing is them. And for me, that's when I want to, you know, it should be the puppet should be coming forward and you should be only seeing that puppet. And that's what's making the difference. That's what's taking your attention, not this person. So you do have some of that trying to explain to actors that it isn't about their faces. It isn't about their appearance. It's about what the puppet is saying, doing, and moving like in order to um, get the character through. I mean, because we're all about character all the time. Puppets are characters. And you want them to live and breathe and look natural. And, if, and the way you do that is movement. So you really do have to understand movement both as what, how your puppet moves, which is super important because every puppet moves differently, no matter who's made it and no matter what you think it is. You have to know what the limitations and the, and the abilities of that puppet are. And then you have to know how that character moves. 
in order to make that work. With trilobites, we had two large trilobites swimming on stage. How do you make that work? They don't have talking mouths, but they're talking, singing, dancing, moving. Let's figure out how to do that best. How would a trilobite move? They really crawl. Not very interesting to have a puppet on the floor crawling the whole time in a stage show. So let's figure out some other way to make them look alive. So we kind of figured out how to move them through space and so that when they would talk and move, they were upright and speaking with each other. Um, and um, it, it, again, it's part of the real fun of puppetry and being a puppet director is figuring out how those movements tell you who the character is and what movements are appropriate and what you should use and not use in terms of the character. And that, I'm gonna slide over, and that um, the, the, the movement tells the story often as much as the words do. And if you're a good puppeteer, you should be able to tell that story without any words. Um, you know, that's always our goal. You know, if you don't need to, if you can show it, then you don't need to say it. But if it's a really important point, if you can show it and say it, then you're driving that point home 100%. People are going to get it on so many levels. And that's what we try to do. That's our gift, right? We have that extra way of telling the story. So. But what, well, for when you are working on a show like Avenue Q, would you recommend to theaters to have a director and then get a puppetry director to work together? Or would you rather recommend to them to find just, um, you know, a puppet director to direct the entire show? Well, um, it's hard because I may be a great puppet director, but I'm not a good music director. I'm not going to be able to teach you to sing every single note in the score. So um, I oftentimes, if you, some good puppet directors can do the whole thing. But just like any musical, you have the main director and you have a music director, and then you have a dance captain who organizes the dancing and it takes care. Once the choreography is done, maintains that the choreography stays the same. So I think a lot of times, if you do have a puppet show that's big like that, then you have an overall director and then you have a puppet captain who maintains that once the puppet choreography is set, and figured out, they maintain that. With Trilobites, it was interesting um, because we did have um, Lee Sunday Evans, fantastic director, um, musical, the musical and children's theater director. Um, and I did the puppetry with her. We worked out the choreography together. And then our stage manager was wonderful and she would correct them every day. She was the one that was writing the choreography, correcting it, saying, you didn't look at the audience. Remember Pam said the focus has to be here. You know, if you don't look at the audience, and that was always my thing. If you don't look at the audience, they, they think you're dead. They don't know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I, and that, that is, because we come from kind of lip sync background in this country, everything Muppets, you think it's the mouth, but it's not really, it's always the focus. It's yeah. always the eyes that are telling us the story, who you're talking to, what you're looking at, what you're paying attention to, it always comes through the eyes. Even when puppets don't have eyes, we see those eyes. So um, it became an interesting process for me in that particular instance where I couldn't be there every day. I couldn't be there for every show. That's what the stage manager did. And even the regular director isn't necessarily there for every show once it's up and running. When you have a run of six weeks, you know, other jobs come in. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> Hopefully, or they used to, let's say other jobs <laughs> used to come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it can be tricky because especially because um, even though you coming in would know how would know what to do. There's a lot of times where the director might not know how to use you necessarily in that situation because I brought in, I've been brought in for a lot of local uh, productions that involved puppetry and sometimes it was a really great collaboration and other times I, uh, they had brought me in and like, okay, well you do this scene. I'm like, well, I don't even know what you, what you want. Like I can help with the, the technical aspects of the puppetry, but like, uh, like in my opinion, on on most of them, like it was up to the director to do more of the story, um, with with things like that. Because again, with, with especially with a musical as an example, it's clear what the choreographer's job is at that point. It's clear what the music director's uh, job and the director with the acting scenes. But with you get with a puppet musical, it's like it's it's a piece of everything, you know. Right, and you do you have to work with everybody actually to help them to understand that very often. 
Because I just go, well, just put the puppet there. And I get, well, it's not going to look good if you just stick it there. It needs to have a reason that it walked over there. It needs, the puppet, sh she needs to know why she had to go to that corner and why she has to wait there. Yeah. Then, then she moves. Just like an actor, you have to give them the exact same thing. And I think sometimes when you're brought in, that is your job, to educate them in terms of how a puppet can impact and what, how you make that puppet alive within the context of your show. I mean, I think when I think about Little Shop of Horrors, which a lot of people have done and directed, very often there isn't necessarily a puppet director with that. Um, but they can always use them, I think, especially with the smaller puppets that come in and the puppets at the end. But generally speaking, I think most people who have um, do a Little Shop don't necessarily have a puppet captain come in and take care of that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right with that. You know, another quick question I have on that is usually with these situations when you come in as a puppet director, are you often involved in the casting or is that usually a decision already made and you're just training these people? Uh, it works both ways. Yeah. Sometimes I'm brought in after the fact when they realize they need a puppet director and so then it's already been cast. Uh, Trial and Bites was already cast. I didn't have anything to do with the casting. They, they, sometimes um, when they did a recasting because people couldn't make it, they did send me videos. And that's one of the things that happens too is people will send me videos of their first choices and then I help them decide who has the best movement or you know the best character voices and stuff. Um, with Sesame Place, I often have help with the casting in that um, because the Sesame Place shows we recently changed um, they weren't just walk around characters. They also included real puppets. Um, we built an Elmo and an Abby and a bird puppet about, I think it ended up being 15% larger to be in the live form, but it was real puppeteering, not walk in a walk around costume. So um, that in particular, I helped them cast that as we were looking for people who were very trainable and could be you know, brought into the park system. And then in something like a park, you have a, a kind of different situation. You got people who are doing the same show eight times a day, right, sometimes. So, or, or they have to switch off, they do four and they, they do every other show. So there's a different personality system that you kind of have to look at too. So, um, and they understand that better, like how someone will work within the context of a theme park which is a different kind of job than, than being an actor in a theater. You know, They're actors and they're doing really great jobs, but it is a different requirement and a different way of functioning. So um, I guess my, my answer really is it depends. Every show is slightly different in terms of bringing people in and, and the casting process. You know, Generally, I do like, if I am going to direct something, I do like some input on the casting because you can end up with people who might be great singers and just... You know, puppetry is one of those things you either got it or you don't. Yeah, you know, that's what I wanted to ask you next about because, you know, I think I feel like I can kind of identify that, too, when I'm brought in for the casting part. But it's hard to articulate. Like, how can you, you can kind of tell, like, oh, this person is will be able to pick it up quick, you know, and even though it wasn't perfect where someone else, when, when they're if it's off, you can say, I don't think they're going to be able to get it, you know, and it's kind of hard. Do you have any. Uh, are you able to articulate that at all and how you're able to That's sense? a really interesting question, but you know it when you see it. And there is, um, you know, some people can dance really well, right? Some people are just instinctive dancers and it's kind of the same thing. Um, some, some people, you know, like singing, you can learn and you can be a pretty good singer, but you may not be a great singer. So it's sort of that basis for me. And it's dancing is the most comparable you know if someone is just an natural dancer and they start to do it and they move you know it if, and there are people who can learn the dance they'll learn it very well and it looks great and they have exactly the steps but it still doesn't have that natural feel and that happens with puppeteers there are people who can learn to do this lip sync perfectly but somehow they never catch sort of the movement and the natural inherent characterization of a puppet yeah. that that comes with that and it's just it's there is just something some people just don't it's not their thing yeah. you know and again to quantify it is very very hard but you do know it when you see it <laughs> just, yeah. it's just an x factor well one thing one thing too because I, I recently just worked on a production of hand to god which used a, a lot of puppetry in it as well and it's it's, it's interesting because whenever i'm brought in I think they always expect me to do a lot more than I do. Whereas a big part of my philosophy is being a little bit more hands-off and letting them 
discover because I feel like if I give them too much, then they're too in their head and they're thinking about it too much rather than letting it just become flowing and natural. Um, right. Is, do you have any type of philosophy? Well, I do that too, actually. I like to see what they think it should be. And then I just help them with minor corrections as they go or ideas on how to make something funny. I, I love physical humor. So if I can figure out a way, you know, if you did this twice in a row, it would become much funnier. So you do that trip fall and do the trip fall again, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's one way you can help. But but again, I agree with you. You let them sort of figure out what's working for them and what the movement is for them is going to be most natural or what the character is. What do they think that, you know, all of us, when we bring character to life, it's us bringing that character to life. So what does this actor want to bring to this character? And then once that's coming out, then you can add, well, physically, if you did this, it's more a natural movement for this character. Um, I do think you have to let people find it first and then help them hone and develop the finer details of what they want yeah. the puppet to do. Oh, that's great. You know, um, yeah, hand to God, if you don't have someone who's a natural sock puppeteer, man, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do with that character. You yeah. know, it's got to be someone who gets it. Yeah. Yeah, the play becomes really, really long very quickly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, because we just did a production, and unfortunately, we only got halfway through our run when it was, um, I think it's still technically postponed at this point, but um, but we, we had a cast that was just out of this world, and the the puppetry that um, that uh, Dan, Daniel Sawyer uh, was his name that he did was just absolutely remarkable, and it was his first time. But you could just tell, and that's one thing that I personally I, I feel like a lot of actors make really good puppeteers because they just understand like you know, emotion and gesture uh, in, in a way. And character in a way that maybe someone who just finds puppetry on its own, you know, and it gets, it's different for everybody. But I've, I've had a lot of very positive experiences working with actors, uh, training them to become puppeteers. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them are very, very good, actually. Um, and it, you're right. It's because they understand character. And if you understand character, then you understand how you want to get that character into the movement, into the, uh, the physical being of the puppet, you know. Um, it's, it's interesting. You, I keep going back to um, Robert Smythe used to say, uh, puppetry is, is like a symphony. You have to have a well-written score, you have to have a good instrument, and you have to have a good player to make it happen, right? If you have someone who plays violin terribly, it doesn't matter how good that score is. And if you have a good player pay, playing a terrible violin, it doesn't matter how good that score is. So because puppetry is that, those three things bound together, um, you do find that actors who do that in another way, they do that with themselves physically, often can extrapolate into the physical puppet and make it seem alive and do that. And sometimes they can't. Sometimes the, the sense of self cannot be given up in an actor. You know what I mean? So much of acting is about you physically making that happen. Um, sometimes that separation is harder for them. But very often they're, they're quite good at it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I loved what, um, what Robert used to, to say and, and using that metaphor about the, the symphony with, with all that. And I guess that also makes me wonder, um, as a, you know, because so much of American puppetry, as you talked about, is the Muppet style and the, um, I imagine there's a tendency, um, I'm sure you've been in things and you've seen things on, on YouTube and of other people where it's just a lot of talking and talking and talking and talking. Um, so can you, can you talk about just like what it is about a script that when you receive it, that you're like, Oh, this is great. This is like, what makes a good puppet script? That's a very interesting question. Um, I do think for it to be a puppet script at all, there has to be a reason there's a puppet there. Mm -hmm. um, if you just take a script and stick a puppet in it, there's, you lose all the advantages. I think a good puppet script has a lot of opportunities for physicality and for telling the story with the being that we're creating for it. Um, you know, 
and yet there's things like War Horse where the story really wasn't a puppet story, but it's a great puppet show. So yeah. you, you don't always know exactly how that is going to fit together. Um, you can't, I don't know, the scripts are hard. You know, puppeteers often don't use scripts. You know, they sort of create it on the fly and then write it down afterwards. And that is one of the things that we've been doing at the O'Neill for so long is trying to get people to lay out their scripts. And then, you know, we have the dramaturgical support of the O'Neill to write them down for them and have them really created. But um, that's a tough one. Every script could be a good puppet script depending on what the character is. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. it's the character. As soon as you tell me what that character is, that becomes a good puppet script. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and sometimes I think too, because I think you made a great point about not just shoving a puppet in there, you know. Well, whereas I would also say, if you do that, if you shove a puppet in there, um, you know, I would hope that they would be able to realize the uh, the extra opportunities to change the script to make it fit more with it. So by by workshopping it and maybe putting a puppet in there where maybe you wouldn't have necessarily thought so, it can lead you to different places in telling the story that you may not have discovered by just writing it out. Correct. And, and puppetry, we're so experimental because once you take those words and you change them by putting them in the mouth of the puppet and adding the physicality, hopefully you improve it. I know a lot of people have done Ariel um, as a puppet for Shakespeare, and that's mm -hmm. always worked really well because she's a spirit and she comes and she goes and she disappears. And what more perfect thing to be a puppet than something that can fly, disappear, and show up again someplace else? you know, a human actor would have a lot more trouble making that happen. So that's when you look at a script and say, this needs to be a puppet um, as a puppeteer. And I try to encourage directors and writers who do come to me at times and just say, just think about what, why this would be better as a puppet. You tell me why, and then I'll help you figure it out. Yeah, that's like, it's almost like a chicken in the egg. Like, should you write a puppet show or should you just write a show and find the opportunities for puppetry? Yeah, right? and it is both. Yeah, it's yeah. it is both. You're right, because right. there are times when you just, you know, you know it needs to be puppets because you, you want it to be puppets. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a thing, puppeteer. Because I'm a puppeteer <laughs> and I like things done with puppets. <laughs> so, but speaking about talk, talk, talking, yeah. um, I've been to uh, Charleville and the, the festivals mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. And I find a number of French puppeteers really like to hear French. <laughs> just, you will see shows that go on for a very long time in French. It is amazing to me. Um, not all. No, oh, you're in maybe. Quebec, so. <laughs> well, Quebec and in um, France, in Charleville. Oh, yeah. oh that's, of course. It's that's... literally um, the last two Charlevilles I've been to in um, I'm now, thinking some of them are, I'm sorry. Yeah, Castelliers <laughs> does the same. There are times that their their talky French shows up there too, um, and I don't mind if it's talky. And it, I understand French, okay, um, but if you're not moving the puppet and it's just flapping its lips or standing there, it doesn't even have lips and it's delivering long monologues. I think everyone's in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Even if you understand the language, you're in trouble. You know. Right. So. Yeah, that's really that's very true. Um, I've I, I've accidentally written a couple of those. I I think along the you way. Write a lot but, of those. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, it's experiments, right? Once you yeah. have all that dial, at least one of the things about having a lot of dialogue is you can process it. You put it on its feet and go. I don't need that line. The puppet can do this, and I no longer need to say I'm going to get a glass of water. I'll just have him pick up the glass of water, and it tells a story without you know, cut, cut, cut. That's probably my directing skill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a good cutter. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you to cut that right away. Just you know, it kind of reminds me of like what we were talking in our, our recent episodes, Cam, when when we did uh, talked about where we interviewed each other and talking about how we work differently because we both kind of have those different ways. Is you you try to find a lot of the problems uh, before they come up, whereas yeah. <laughs> I like to kind of jump into it and and discover them in real time and make the edits afterward. Um, so yeah, really, both ways do work. It's just a matter of yeah, what you're more comfortable with doing, what your process is, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And again, that's one of the things we like about the O'Neill is that we allow you to go both processes if possible. You know, that there's a place where you can go and work with people on both sides. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, can't believe we're not having a real one this year. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Keep going. You know, and I think a good example of that is, is is Ronnie's work too, because he he writes all these very intricate uh, stories, but then also like the whole Daisy Theater is so much of it is uh is, is completely improv too, which is like which is the opposite. So yeah, like again, it can and and, and again, a lot of those improv situations inspire new works too. So yeah. Yeah, and, and Ronnie's a great example of that. He, he can be very disciplined and write very, you know, very regular, writes his scripts, edits it, works with the dramaturge, reworks it, reworks it, reworks it. And then he also has this free side that just goes out and improvs like, the hell out of stuff, you yeah. know, and, and that becomes who he is. I mean, Yes, he's he's doing a talk. As he's the first master class. I'm so excited. I love hearing him talk. Um, you guys Absolutely. have interviewed him, right? Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And his his bedtime stories recently on, yeah. on Instagram his have, been have been excellent. <laughs> um, you know, as as we kind of start to wrap up a little bit um this is a, your second time now on the show and we've we've talked about a lot of really great things and i know you've also done a lot of interviews elsewhere before about all this sort of thing is there has there ever been something that you've thought like i really hope that they ask me about this because it's either a soapbox i want to stand on or it's a story that i've never been able to tell or anything like that that you just want to like make sure is is out there for the history books that's a good question. Um, it's the best non-question I could think about. Yeah, it's, it's completely... a non-question. Yeah, it's completely <laughs> open. Um, only that I wish that we had a better way of recording puppet shows. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it's much better now that we have a lot of video and internet, but I do... I think one of my soapboxes would be we have to start recording scripts like like so that in 400 years they can pick up a puppet script and understand how to do it. Um, you know, with dance, they have love on notation. And so even though um, we'll record dances, it's also recorded, um, written down, and you can understand what you need to do because it's written in this language that's specific for dance. In a way, we need that for puppetry, right? Because, yeah. because we're movement and we're language. Um, and I think, you know, when the Dick Myers show project was I was being just going to think about that. I was, I was yeah. just thinking about that. Yeah, you know, Seth couldn't find um, the exact scripts on how they were done. And there were some videos. And there's a lot of things like that where we just don't have any idea what the script was or how it goes. And I think that's really important historically. I think we do need to think about how we preserve our work. Um, and again, that's another thing we do at the O'Neill. We're trying to get it all archived. Every show that's been done there in the past at least 10 years has been um, archived and put in the O'Neill um, library as a written piece. Now, um, still have the limitations of movement. You know, you can't say it's hard. Again, it's wonderful that we have video now and we have cameras that we can record how the movements are going and you can extrapolate that but um i don't know i don't i don't know that it'll list that will last forever yeah no i i love that so much i think that's i think that that is it's so important and i think i think one hesitation people have is the fact that when when you record it and when you look back at it, it doesn't have that same feeling and which is why they don't want to do it. But I would say, you know, again, that's not what documenting is about. And even though you don't get the whole essence of the show, you still get a lot of important stuff, which is better than nothing. And what I would uh, maybe compare it to is even like cave <laughs> writing on cave walls that we found from ancient times. Like that's not, that wasn't the best way for us to absorb the information now, but it was, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. You know, um, it's just, yeah, we know it existed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think there are, I have seen some incredibly beautiful puppet shows that will never be seen again because the artist has passed away and absolutely no recording of them. 
Now, maybe that's something also special is that it's just exists for that one moment in time. Just for that one moment, you get to experience this and maybe it does make you plug in and be more present at any time someone performs like that. But on the other hand, there are things that really should be able to be passed down historically. And for us to continue to develop as a, a legitimate, the legitimate wonderful art form it is, we do need some way of recording and moving it forward. That's, that's pretty important. And especially that's how arts grow. They build off of yeah, the previous, um, yeah, just a build. Should be able to do the Dick Meyer show and then do another show off of that and be able to extrapolate how that you can make that happen. Or much like Shakespeare, reinterpret. How many reinterpretations of a Shakespearean show has there been? You know, so, right. so many. And we should be able to do that with puppets too, to add our own twist to once it's an established show, uh, yeah. to move that forward, to move that needle forward in that way. Well, another thing people might say too is, well, I don't have a camera. I don't have, and again, I would still just encourage people use whatever you do have, even if it's not the best, even if it is just your cell phone. You know, if a famous saying in, in photography is like the best camera is the camera you have when the moment counts. And it's, it's, it's better to just to have it. Even, again, w one thing that I've always done is I've recorded every show that I had done just for my own, um, to be able to reflect on my own performances in something. You know, not even to put it out into the world. And to be honest, most of the time I don't look at it. I've probably only watched like like uh, like two out of the maybe like hundred that I've done. But it's just, it's just comforting. Well, and also you never know what's going to happen sometimes you can discover a little bit of magic uh in a performance especially if you have a show that uh, can have opportunity for some amount of improv in it you, you find these little gems mm -hmm, exactly and and i think one of the things that happens is um archival footage is archival footage it is not a performance it's just the archive it's just the recording of what happened so you know the sequences you know what it was um, you know, and, and people get intimidated by the fact, well, it's not going to be a good video. Well, it's not a video. It's an archive. It's yeah. a record, strictly a record. Um, you know, a good video production is huge. Think how long it takes us to shoot a Sesame Street, which is a video production. That's different. Just record it. You know what? That's what oh, I, I hope the O'Neill can do something like that because I know they archive all their own stuff, or maybe not O'Neill. There should be some, maybe even Puppeteers of America or, or, or Unima or something, have an archive that you can like. Uh, you know, email or send the video files to, and it's just like archived and maybe almost, almost like a, cause, but then we, we, what, what do you think about it? Well, what are they going to do with it? Like, it's not for them to put publicly, but maybe like every, I don't know, this is so long, <laughs> but like every hundred years, uh, you know, yeah. it's released, you know, <laughs> or, or 50. Or maybe it's not, whatever. maybe it is yeah. strictly archival where someone can request to see it. You know, oh, yeah, I probably. heard Adam Krutner did a show in 19, you know, in 2019. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I want to see that show. Do you have a copy of it? And then someone yeah. can, you know, in this day and mm -hmm. age with the amount of information um, sourcing we can do and archiving and video, really, we could do that. It's not as though someone has to have giant, you know, shelves full of videotapes anymore in order to do that. Um, that's actually a really good idea. No. Yeah, yeah. Again, I was just thinking of that. That's why I said that was all those years and stuff, thinking about how like public domain works with like books and stuff. Um, I was thinking some some model like that might be well too, because then then you wouldn't because after a certain point maybe it could just be public. Because if you're watching something that's fifty hundred years old, it's kind of obvious I would think that it's just archival footage and not meant to be some sort of a show. And that way also because obviously as all these videos pile up, it becomes such a bigger and bigger job for someone to be able to facilitate that. So that way every once in a while it can kind of be purged and made a public responsibility for people to search for it. On on their own but yeah that, that should definitely some sort of like a, a, a international pu a puppetry video database that's curated by somebody exactly yeah not just to find funding for that yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> always the problem a couple hundred terabytes of uh of storage space yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. well um, i mean oh yeah. go ahead i'm sorry no that's fine i was just gonna say well it's getting so cheap now compared to what it used to be that that's true yeah, that's true. Um, one one other thing before we wrap up, um, I I didn't know, and if, if you'd rather not 
um, talk about it, we completely understand. But um, since we last spoke, um, uh, we, the world lost Carol Spinney. Um, and obviously that was a huge loss for, for Sesame. Um, can you just talk about, I, I, I don't even know what the question is, but um, you know, what, what that has meant for the show and how you guys are, are persevering through all that. I mean, um, well, yeah. Carol had stepped back a bit for the mm -hmm. last few years. I mean, he was getting older and yeah. um, he also had developed some physical issues. So, um, but in terms of the show, that spirit that Carol established is always going to be Carol. I mean, it's just both with Oscar and Big Bird. You just, it's Carol. That is Carol's heart. For me personally, um, you know, Carol was the person who got me into Sesame Street. So it's, it's, it's quite hard to have lost him. Um, and I just don't, I don't think there'll be another guy like him. That's for sure. He was a, he was a very one of a kind guy and he told the best weirdo stories ever, which we're not really allowed to tell anyone. I would never tell on this kind of piece, but he had these really funny stories that he would tell us over and over again in the, in the green room. And all of us would just listen and, and laugh and recite the last line with him half the time because he told it to us so many times. But that was Where such to, a Mac? Treat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is more reason why we need that archive, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we had Carol telling some of those stories, it would have been awesome. And, you know, back when we started, it, the only time you got video was on camera out front. So we would have never had that. I mean, there's such a benefit to this day and age of having this kind of thing where we can just record it fairly easily and make a pretty good show. Whereas even 10 years ago, this was a difficult thing to do, you know? Right. Um, so I wish we could have gotten more Carol actually care, but Debbie, if you saw any, the movie, Debbie was wonderful at recording all kinds of things with Carol. So we do have a really great record of Carol's life overall. Um, but the world really lost somebody then. I mean, it really was a light, light for children going out. Yeah. We'll miss them always. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, for sure. One thing I was thinking is like, you know, at this point, especially now that, you know, this is your second time on, I was just wondering, like, what type of puppetry would you like to see more of in the world? If anything. Um, you know, I, I love it all so much. And what we tend to do is like suddenly in this country, everyone's doing tabletop. And then suddenly <laughs> everyone is doing shadows. And then suddenly everyone is doing some other form. I do think that it is time for a renaissance of glove puppets, frankly, mm -hmm. which is a very um, overlooked style at this point. I think people are doing, everybody does this, or they do um, tabletop, or they do shadow, and there's some rod puppets happening. But I think glove puppets have really been left behind. And that's Paul Vincent Davis was sort of the master of that. Um, and Nikki Tilrow was quite wonderful at it too. Um, and she learned a very specific Czech style of hand puppetry where the, um, and I, I probably should look it up actually, that would be an interesting research project. But they had very large heads and little bodies. And that just made for a certain look to them that was, that was charming. And the skill set required by a good hand puppeteer is, is, is like ballet. I mean, there are so many specific movements that tell the story. And if you understand that through hand puppetry, you can make any puppet move appropriately, um, any style of puppet move appropriately, because it has a way of making you think about movement and how movement is analyzed and how you get that in there. Silhouette um, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, how you sit, how you stand up, why you breathe, why, how you fly a kite, how do you dig a hole, all of those things you can do with hand puppets. And once you learn that, you can translate it to any form of puppetry because you understand the breakdown of the movement. So I think maybe hand puppets I'd like to see more of, you know, the glove, beep, 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 those <laughs> yeah. kind of puppets. <laughs> well, hopefully some of the participant pieces this year, you get some people grilling, uh, grilling them on, on hand puppets. And yeah. Well, actually, and my, my good buddy, I don't know, do you know John Jennings by chance? 
No. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, John Jennings, um, who who's done he's done a lot of uh, Henson style puppetry and stuff. Uh, he's done a lot of work for Disney. But about a I think about a year and a half ago, he started a glove puppet show that he does. I think he does like two or three times a week. And it's I mean, talk about twenty first century. He was ahead of the curb. What everyone's doing now. Um, uh, he's doing a live stream show, so completely live on the internet, like uh, at least twice or three times a week. And he's been doing it. For like a year and a half, two years, and he calls it's called Tipsy Roo. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. He's going to be a guest on the pot. Yeah, he's going to be a guest on the podcast soon too, which I'm really excited about. And he's really just doing some interesting stuff. And again, at first when I first saw it too, I was like, cause I knew his background in puppetry, so I was su- surprised to see him doing the glove puppetry too. But he's it's amazing what he's able to do with it. Oh, cool! I'd love to see that because I have been. Um looking for a glove puppeteer to come and teach at the O'Neill to sort of spark that interest again. Yeah, um, that would be excellent. Oh, actually, someone like him might be great, too, because especially the, the added, uh, you know, of being able to do it completely online because it's like a full, since he's able to do the glove pot, but he's actually operating the computer stuff with his other hand, like switching the camera and stuff and and uh, like different, uh, it's almost like a, a late night show where you know how the images come up in the corner. And again, he controls all that with his other hand, which is, uh, it's wild. It's completely live. It's not. I would definitely recommend people checking it out because he's also a great resource on, because a lot of people are trying to discover that now. You know, he's been doing that for two years and people all of a sudden, you know, have to kind of do that since they can't do their in-person shows the way that they used to. And solo at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Well, Pam, this has been really great and we so appreciate your time, but um, we were wondering as we wrap up if we could get one more puppeteer story out of you. Uh, like, uh, what do you mean? Oh, so, so some, something uh, in, the, in the spirit of Jim Krupa, uh, something of a, a tale of something that went wrong either when you were directing a show or um, on, on set somewhere where something didn't go right in the moment, but we could look back on it now and have a good laugh. Um, let's see. We were waiting to go on for the O'Neill, and they were honoring Michael Douglas. And uh, so I'm, I have a puppet. I'm holding it like this, but I also have a very low cut dress. <laughs> and Michael Douglas comes out and I think the, we're standing outside smoking cigarettes or some damn thing. You know, people are just outside waiting to go on. And I'm working. Sorry, is the this puppet. for the Monte Cristo Awards? <laughs> yes, okay. I think it was a Monte Cristo. And, but years and years and years ago. Okay. And so I'm out there working the puppet, trying to figure it out. And he comes out and he starts talking to the puppet, I thought. And then I realized he is not talking to the puppet or my face. He is looking only at my cleavage the whole time. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, he's married to Catherine Zeta-Jones, and he's looking at my cleavage. (laughs) It made me laugh really hard, and the puppet was laughing really hard. And and I forget, I think I might have been with Bart Rockefeller, who kind of said, after he left, he said, I don't think he knew you had eyes. (laughs) Was that the kind of puppeteer story? <laughs> yes. <laughs> to put it in. <laughs> yes, there's oh been crazy stuff always. But that's the one that came to mind. I'm sorry. That's what I got. <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. Um uh and now uh for for the listeners too, uh, what's the best way for them to um discover more of your work or when you have announcements, any social media or websites or. or yeah, well, I'm on Facebook and the O'Neill page is on Facebook. I do that. And there's an Instagram. I have an Instagram account, so you can look on that. Um, okay. I'm not the best at social media. I, I get kind of hermity, but um, I will put announcements and things like that out on those two forms when they come through. Oh, great. Excellent. Wonderful. So, yeah. Well, this has been a, a pleasure, Pam. Thank you so much for your time and, and coming on. And you do, You're doing such a great job here. I really love it. So congratulations again. And uh, I hopefully we'll be able to see each other for real sometime before yes. too long. That would be excellent. And, uh, and again, if anybody, um, check the O'Neill, the O'Neill.org, um, and we'll have the information on the master classes and the um, pub nights. And I hope you guys will be able to join us. That'd be wonderful. Certainly. Well, yeah, Pam, thanks. Thanks, guys. Love you guys. Love you too. Take care. Stay healthy.